Hey everyone, I want to welcome you back to another episode of Tandy Town. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about beating the market long term through covered calls. But before we get into this video, I just want to thank all of you again that continue to remain subscribed to Tandy Town that allows us to fund the donations um, to American Cancer Society every single month. Um, I also tweeted out today that I... If you guys are in favor of it, which it seems like the vast majority of you are, um, for the next six months, I'm going to rotate the donations to the Alzheimer's organization or association, excuse me. Um, I think cancer is a very important topic. Um, at the same time, we've donated over $10,000 in the past six months to American Cancer Society, which is amazing. And I think in another equally as important disease that hasn't really been um, a cure for yet is Alzheimer's and dementia. So I want to rotate and th that's another thing that has directly affected my life as well as and, and I'm sure much of you. So I was thinking we did six months with American Cancer Society. Next six months, we're going to do Alzheimer's associations. And then once that's up, we either rotate the money back to American Cancer Society or we find a new organization or a recommendation or something like that. But anyways, appreciate you guys that stay subscribed. It really means a lot to me. Um, so getting right into this episode, I want to talk about how you can beat the market over a sustained period of time through selling covered calls. And the first thing I have to say about this is that when you go on Twitter, you're often met with a lot of people who are speculators. And oftentimes they're more than speculators. They're just kind of degenerate gamblers. Um, I think there's a difference between spot trading cryptocurrencies um, I think that, and, and options trading on the stock market, um, depending on your capital allocation. Um, you know, when it comes to options trading on the stock market, um, it's not a dangerous endeavor for people that have a decent bankroll, okay? Because these people, once you have a decent bankroll and uh, your profits are, are that of, um, you know, something that could s sustain your lifestyle, then it makes sense to reduce or to risk one or two percent of your portfolio for an options trade because that's essentially it gives you the opportunity to take the same amount of risk um, if the option goes to zero then it would be just having a one to two percent stop loss, you know, buying and selling regular shares. Um, the problem is, is that the most degenerate and the most um, sort of speculative personalities usually are risking everything that they have. Okay. And there's a reason why they never have anything. It's in that reason itself. It's because a lot of people especially in cryptocurrency, especially during this NFT market right now, a lot of people aren't buying in for the sake of owning a JPEG um, or owning a really cute profile picture of a penguin. If people are solely per or crypto punks, right? If they're solely purchasing it because they have that much expendable income, that's not speculating. That's not gambling. They're literally just spending money on something. And I have zero problems with that. The problem is the entirety of Twitter, like 98% of people, are basically gambling, right? They are in it so that they can make money flipping things. They're not purchasing things just because they look cool. They're not minting things just because, um, you know, they like the profile picture or whatever it could be. They're actually doing it because they're all trying to flip NFTs and trade NFTs to make a profit. And the danger with that is because it relies on getting sucking more and more people in. Because if you don't suck enough people in, and let's say the market turns and all the uh, bids and expendable income that people have evaporates because all of a sudden all their holdings are going down, um, then all these people are stuck with no exit liquidity. And if their intention was to get in and get out, essentially they're going to be newfound bag holders over a, uh, you know, a reasonable period of time. And so a lot of people, I mean, I like to speculate. Um, I trade GBTC and I've been getting into options a little bit more, um, more so because I'm recognizing that I like, um, that I can definitely risk like 1%. Uh, usually I risk about half a percent of my portfolio on a substantial sized um, 
options trade. And it's because I just realized that like I can risk half a percent even if this goes to zero. Um, but if it does go up, then I can make, you know, two, three, four hundred percent of my money. So to me, that's a skewed, a really heavily skewed RR in my favor when I take the appropriate trades because my loss is immediately defined. And then I also have substantial more upside than if I were to take shares on a trade. But I have the same defined amount of risk, which is really cool. Um, but that's only because I have a certain amount in my portfolio that allows me to do that. Most people that are options trading, okay, 90% of them lose money. And the average loss in their portfolios is 33%. They're putting themselves through a depression. And this is because most option traders are on Robinhood with less than $1,000 in their account. Okay, when you risk your entire account to buy one or two options contracts, you are going to get in trouble every single time. And that's the reality of what most people are doing. Most people are putting their entire net worth into NFTs because they think they can get a quick flip. They think there's it's going to pay off. They think there's going to be exit liquidity. It's the same game. And so the reason I kind of went on that tangent is because you have to know when you are doing covered calls. It is not sexy, okay? It is not something that's going to make you hundreds or thousands of percentage gains, okay? It's not something that's going to get you rich in the next two years. But it is something over a sustained period of time that allows you to maximize the power of compounding and yields to generate a stupid amount of money over the course of your lifetime. And that's what I want to focus on in this episode, okay? So I want to focus in this episode particularly on how you can be somebody that is like a yield maximalist, somebody that likes long-term investing, somebody that would be ecstatic about a 20% return in a year because it's not like cryptocurrency where you might make 800% in a year, but then you face, uh, you know, an 80% drawdown and you really only made 200%, okay, uh, over the course of a cycle that you technically have no idea is when or if it's going to end. Um, so it's really, really important that I sh stress the point that this is consistency, okay? Cryptocurrency is not consistent at all, okay? It can be for people that profitably trade it. Usually that's scalpers, um, but long-term investing in cryptocurrency is often one or one and a half years of euphoric upside met by three years of devastating downside okay i'm not interested in that i have too much money at risk to put myself through an 80 percent drawdown okay i on the other hand like and know the power of compounding at an interest rate of 20 percent okay that is a powerful wealth building tool and i'm not talking to people in this episode that want to speculate or that want to gamble, or that are super risky. I want to talk to people that know that if they invest $500 a month from the time they are 20 to the age of 65 at a 20% annual rate of return, which I know for most of you sounds very minimal, that if you can do that every single year, on average, you will have $91 million by the time you are 65. And so the common argument with this is always well, I don't want to be rich when I'm older. So, well, I can't wait that long to be financially free. Well, if I don't take a substantial risk to become financially free at this moment right now, then what's the point? Then I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to be able to do it the traditional route. My parents lost everything in 2008. I've seen the effects of investing in the stock market. That's all a bunch of bullshit. For the fact that people lack patience... And they lack the humbleness and the discipline that it takes in order to really dedicate yourself. Because over the long run, I promise you, most of the people on Twitter are going to lose money. They are going to have no savings because they were degenerate. Because it is a gambling culture. Because there are a few select personalities on Twitter that have found tremendous, tremendous success in various different niches and they are trying to replicate that even though the probability is incredibly against them covered calls requires the sort of long-term investing approach but it's better than dividend investing 
a common trait that a lot of people fuck up when they are investing is that they only go and they only search for stocks that are going to pay a really high dividend. AT&T, ExxonMobil, uh, Coca-Cola, uh, Pfizer. Okay, A lot of these companies over the past 10, 20 years have significantly underperformed the S&P 500. Some of them, AT&T and ExxonMobil, are probably down 50% from where they were a decade ago. And the reason for that is because these companies are forking out so much in dividends that they have no money to reinvest in new business opportunities. But they can't slash the dividend because that would cut the stock prices in half because that's 80% of the reason why people own their stock. The problem dividend investors make is they chase 5% at ExxonMobil, but then ExxonMobil trends down. They chase 7% at AT&T, but AT&T continues to drop. And then they find themselves making 5% on a dividend yield, which is cool, but then they're reinvesting the dividends in a company that continues to go down. And if the company goes down 3% a year, their actual real rate of return is 2%, which is in line with inflation on, on average. So they're actually like not making any money. Whereas had they invested that in like an index fund, they'd probably be up 10 to 12% in a year on average. So a lot of mistakes that dividend investors make is they only chase yield. They don't care about the company. A lot of long-term investors, the mistake that they make is they only chase the company. Tesla, super, super fucking expensive. Is it going to go up in the future? Probably. But why would you only own Tesla? Why would you ever put all your money in a single stock? Same goes for Apple. I mean, there are some people that are probably listening to us that bought Apple in 2012. And there are also some people that probably bought BlackBerry in 2010. Now, I'm not saying that Apple is BlackBerry and that Apple is going to collapse. But I am saying that as companies age, there is a sort of a turning point where if there's not being enough money reinvested in a company, the growth slows, the growth starts declining, and then the stock obviously follows the growth of the company. So if the company's not growing, the stock's going down, mostly every time. Altria, which is a fantastic performing Tabasco, excuse me, not Tabasco, oh my god, tobacco company. I can't believe I just said that. Tobacco company has been trending down for years now. Because it pays a six or seven percent dividend yield, tobacco is on the decline with you know e-cigarette companies and vapes and whatnot, and they're paying out so much in dividends, and then they're starting to stall on their revenue. That the stock is probably not going to recover. When it comes to long-term investing, you have to be some somebody that tries your best to maximize company or indexes and maximize yield. Okay, that is fucking crucial. Perfect example of this would be, I really like Walmart. Okay, Walmart is a growing company. They're continuing to invest enough money in their company, continue growing it, and they pay a dividend of like 1.5%. Same goes for Home Depot and Lowe's and Target. Okay, a lot of great brands make sure that they pay a 1% to 2% dividend yield if they are very profitable so that they have enough to continue to reinvest inside the company to grow earnings, to grow revenue, which is going to result in capital gains. So those are the type of companies that maximize capital gains and yield. I want to talk about covered calls because the yield generated through covered calls is substantially greater than what it is through dividends only. Okay, So this means that instead of having to invest in a company that pays a dividend, which is Costco, Target, Walmart, Disney used to pay one, uh, Johnson & Johnson, okay, a lot of great growing companies that have continued to be a long, around for a long time. Instead of having to choose those specific companies, what you can do is pick ETFs or your favorite companies or companies that are still on the rise and generate a yield when a dividend might not exist or when a dividend exists to generate a higher yield. Okay, and the importance behind why covered calls is so important is because of that is very high probability. Okay, 
if you don't know what a covered call is, I suggest you go listen to one of my previous episodes because I'm going to explain it here very briefly. A covered call is when you buy at least 100 shares of a stock. Okay, You own 100 shares of the stock. Let's say stock ABC is trading at 50 bucks. So you spend $5,000 to buy 100 shares of ABC. Then somebody, you know, a speculator comes to the options market and they want to bet that stock ABC is going to go to 52 bucks by the end of next week. What you do is you basically sell them an options contract. You're going to collect, say, 30 bucks for that week. And you're going to say, okay, if the stock reaches 52 by next week, I will sell you all my shares at 52. Okay, so let's say stock ABC goes to 52. The person just made $200 in capital gains tax, okay, because the stock went from 50 to 52, which is a $2 difference times 100 shares, 200 bucks. They also collected the $30 in premium no matter what, okay? So they made 230 bucks on 5,000. That's a 4% return, okay? The obligation is that you have to sell the shares at 52 most of the time. Okay, there are exceptions when you might not have to sell your shares, but you always want to assume that you're going to be selling your shares. Okay, so what does that mean? That means you have to, whenever you start selling covered calls, it has to be in a company that you wouldn't mind selling. It has to be in a company that you wouldn't mind buying shares of in the first place. Okay, that's really important. What you're doing essentially is you are purchasing shares in a company that you believe in, but using it to collect yield. Okay. And what you're doing is you're trying to sell options to collect a yield over a certain period of time while the stock goes down, while the stock goes sideways, while the, while the stock stays within a range that is below the strike price that you sold on the covered call. Because as the stock continues to not appreciate, you are earning a yield on it. And that can you can use that to buy more shares of the stock for free. You can use that to buy more shares of another stock that's going to generate you more yield. And what it comes down to is essentially what you're doing is you're collecting yield on volatility within a stock that you like. And that yield, if you're smart about it, can usually be between half a percent and a percent a week. Now, sometimes you're going to be able to generate higher yields. I personally just bought a few thousand shares of Robinhood because the yield on the covered calls, because Robinhood has been incredibly volatile in the past couple weeks, the yields that are being paid out are like 3% a week, which annualizes 150%, which is 15 times better than the market average. Now, that doesn't mean that I am going to be holding Robinhood shares for that long. Right. The intention is basically you want to buy a good company that aligns with the technical support, kind of like a swing trade. Okay. And you want to start selling calls at a point where you would want to take profit. That's the best way that I think I can explain it. And the way that I've explained it to Dime, who is somebody that is definitely getting more into theta, is that I've always described cash selling puts as getting paid to to, um, put limit bids and selling covered calls as a way to get paid for selling limit sales, okay? You're basically setting take profits and bids. Take profits with covered calls, bids with cash secured puts, and you're getting paid to do that. And so the beauty of covered calls is that you're always going to continue to collect the yield every time that you sell a covered call. And no matter what happens to the stock, that yield is yours. So if you can collect half a percent a week on a great company like, you know, Apple or maybe you want to do an index fund like VTI or SPY or something like that, if you have that kind of capital, then you can collect 15, 25% probably just in yields. Now, obviously, if there's a market correction, okay, then it's going to be a lot more difficult to sell covered calls. The volatility is going to go higher, so you can probably start selling calls further out of the money. But you have to be careful because if you end up selling covered calls during a market correction and the market bounces and you sell covered calls at a strike price that is lower than your cost basis that you purchased for the shares, then you can potentially lose money on that trade. But for the vast majority of time, 
it's going to be incredibly profitable to sell covered calls because you're always going to be collecting a yield and then eventually the stock will appreciate fast enough to where you can realize capital gains and yield on the stock and if that happens then you just move on to the next stock um, which is a pretty simple concept you can't be married to the stock i will say that okay it's also not smart to sell covered calls on a company that you have substantial outlying capital gains tax if you bought apple in 2011 and you were up 10x it does not make sense to sell covered calls on apple why because for every year that apple goes up 10 percent, you are going to double your money because you're up 10x and a 10 percent move on your initial cost basis is going to double your money every single time so why would you in pursuit of basically finding you know a 15 to 25 percent annual yield why would you risk a hundred percent return on average right that's not smart it also means that if you were up 100k then you're going to face a fifteen thousand dollar tax bill as soon as you um were to be assigned on those covered calls which is also not a profitable endeavor so it has to be on a company that you think is going to continue to go up or an ETF that you think is going to continue to go up, but something that you're not going to be super pissed off about if it does sell, something that you're like, okay, cool, I made money on the trade, let's go find the next one. Or it has to be something that um, you're not going to have substantial capital gains taxes on for a, you know a measly uh, few hundred bucks, few thousand bucks a year. Okay, So obviously that's going to depend on the account size that you have. But that is definitely something to take into consideration. But the reason that covered calls are so powerful are because, one, they produce a greater yield than dividends. Okay, A lot of people just like investing in dividend stocks. They take their 3% yield. Stock goes up 2% a year, but they're really making 5%. You subtract 2% from inflation. They're really making 3%. Whereas you know the S&P 500 is up 17% this year. Inflation's at 4.5%. They're up 13%. And the S&P 500 pays, although... a the S&P 500 does pay a dividend. Uh, it's lower than what dividend stock investors usually shoot for. Second thing that's amazing, it takes 15 minutes a week. I've talked about this in every single one of my episodes. My strategy when it comes to cash secured puts is always selling outside of a 16 delta. Okay. And what that means is that um, basically there is an 85 to 95% chance that, you, that that stock is not going to finish below a 16 delta. Basically, the 16 delta tells you that there's a 16% probability that that is going to end up in the money by the time of expiration. Now, I've done my research. 60 to 70 years of market analysis actually says that um, 95% of all market volatility occurs within inside a 16 delta, which is two standard deviations. Okay, I'm sure you've heard of a 10 standard deviation move during 2008 or 2020 or whatever. But 95% of all market volatility occurs within a 16 delta, um, which actually means that you could have 5% chance. So that's why I say, you know, 15 to 5 or 85 to 95% chance. So it's going to produce a greater yield than dividends. Um, when it comes to selling covered calls, I usually actually sell more than a 16 delta. Sometimes I usually do like 25. And the reason for that is because. I can get higher premiums, which means a higher yield, and no matter what, if the stock goes up, I'm going to make money on capital gains. So I'm not as concerned as about selling the stock as I would be about getting assigned and buying the stock. As I, So covered calls, I am going to be happy if I get assigned. Okay. Cash secured puts, still going to be happy, but there's greater risk. Okay. With covered calls, I will sell inside a 16 delta because I know I'm going to make money on the underlying if it goes up, and the underlying being the shares that I purchased. Cash secured puts, you are not going to make money on any underlying because cash secured puts are cash secured, which means if the market goes up, if it goes down, you have no effect on the underlying because your underlying is cash. So the only way that you can make money on cash secured puts is yield, so you have to be more careful. Whereas covered calls, you can make money in capital gains on the equity, which is the shares, and on the yield from selling covered calls, which is awesome. Second thing that's amazing about covered calls, it takes 15 minutes a week. You wake up Monday, you find 
um, you know, if you have been holding a stock for a while that's continued to work selling covered calls, you just continue selling calls that you would want to take profit at. Okay. That takes 15 minutes a week. That means you don't have to stare in front of a chart every day. That means you don't have to freak out when SPY drops, you know, a dollar because some news came out. Okay. It's very, very simple. Second thing is when we are talking about, um, you know, the general broad market, uh, the yield itself is probably going to beat the market, right? I, can, I would assume that it's fairly, fairly reasonable to assume that you're going to make 15% a year just selling covered calls, okay? Even if the stock is not very volatile, even if you choose a blue chip, you can find a way to make one-third of a percent of the collateral selling covered calls. No problem. And if the stock doesn't go up at all, it literally stays flat on the year, you're still going to make 15% return, which is going to beat the S&P 500. I think it's fairly reasonable to assume 20% returns. Um, I obviously had an outstanding 2020. Um, as far as percentage return with my options trade, with my cryptocurrency trading, um, but even with my um, theta trades, um, which were basically after those two uh, big trades, uh, I made about 75% last year. So I spent most of last year selling covered calls. I made 75% return. Now, last year was incredible. Volatility was high. Stocks were going up like crazy. Uh, I made a lot of money on the underlying of a lot of shares, and I made a lot of money on the premium because the volatility was high. This year, it's more difficult. Uh, this year, I'm up about, um, when we don't factor in cryptocurrency trading and we're just talking about underlying, uh, I'm up about 30 to 35%, okay, which is still beating the market, still fantastic. It's still going to get me stupid rich if I can continue along that path. From theta trades, I've made about 30 to 35% this year. So I'm obviously ecstatic about that. Now, it's not going to be the 900% that people are probably making in cryptocurrency markets. Have fun staying poor, not going to make it, whatever you want to call it. But I also know that I'm never going to be faced with like an 80% drawdown. I'm, I don't have to freak out and watch charts on the weekends. I don't have to worry and wake up in a cold sweat just because I feel like there was market volatility while I was asleep. I don't have to set alerts and alarms that, that are going to go off at 2 a.m. because price reached a certain point. I can go on with my day. And that means school. That means going to the gym. It means working on outside activities. Um, that means hanging out and socializing with friends and family. That means I have the opportunity to spend 15 minutes a week doing something like that that reduces a lot of stress and increases my probabilities very very much third thing is talked about this 20 years old 500 bucks a month you make 20 percent a year 91 million i doubt that anybody that has had tremendous success even on crypto twitter i think you can probably count a handful of people that 20 or 30 years from now are going to have close to nine figures okay i don't think 91 million at 65 is going to be um, a problem for anybody by any standard unless you're LARPing um, a lot of people on Twitter like to LARP about uh, How 10 million dollars isn't a lot of money anymore. It's a fuck ton of money The fuck are you talking about? That's a plenty of money to be financially free Okay Last thing Beating the market man How many people spend their lives trying to beat the market? The other day Hasaka tweeted something about hedge fund manager performance in 2021, one single hedge fund has beat the S&P 500. Second best was 12%. Mind you, the S&P 500 is up 17.5% this year. One fund was up like 35% because they made a ton of money on GameStop. Second best performing hedge fund in the entire world is up 12%. 12 when they could have stuck it in the S&P 500 and made 17 for their clients. It goes to show you the lengths that people will go to try to find a way to beat the market. But they'll do so in a way that involves picking stocks, uh, having hedges, um, risk-adjusted portfolios, quantitative and quantitative uh, you know strategies. There's so much bullshit that you just don't need to engage yourself in because it's really just an intelligence dick swinging contest. Don't engage in that. You don't need to go into the NFT market to make to be stupid rich. 
you don't need to learn how to trade or to evaluate what the value of an NFT is. You don't have to be shilling it on Twitter because you hope that people are going to buy your bags. You don't have to be leverage trading on FTX or trading perps or options on Deribit. Okay, you just need to find consistency, which is something that people on Twitter will hardly ever find. They'll have huge run-ups and they'll have huge drawdowns, and that is a life that is going to make you have a heart attack at 50. I don't think that's important. I would much rather make 20, 30% year in, year out than make, you know, a thousand percent one year and then 80% drawdown the next. That means you don't have to constantly refresh your account balances. That means you add to your portfolios every single month from your business, from your job, whatever it may be, wherever you earn your income from. You contribute, you take your yield, you buy your stock, you forget about it. You go into your life. You find happiness. You reach the goals that you want outside of money, whatever it may be. Covered calls, 1,000%, one of the most powerful strategies in the entire market. And the reason that nobody will ever adopt it is because it's, it seems almost too simple. Really. It seems almost too simple that you can spend 5, 10 minutes a week, 15 minutes a week, collecting a yield on a stock and going on with your life. People think they have to do something all the time. They always think they have to be reinventing the wheel. They always think that they have, no pun intended, they always think that they have to be coming up with these crazy intelligent theories and, and speculations and reasonings and in order to find some sort of edge in the market or they have to find a specific strategy and they can never share it with anybody. Um, it's just not the case. The people that perform the best in the markets throughout history have always been people that maximize consistent compounding. Not people that are YOLOing their money. Not people that are trying to reinvent the wheel. The only person that I can imagine that has success reinventing the wheel was Jim Simons, who was a quant, for, uh, quant trading firm who has developed in algorithms that can predict market volatility. Now, I doubt that anybody... Most people are not going to be able to accomplish that and have a consistent track record of like 30% returns for the last 30 years. Okay, that's why he's stupid rich. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. I am telling you right now, you can probably generate 20%, 30% returns for the rest of your life. As long as you're not idiotic and buying calls on, on or buying stock for Wish or fucking, you know, stupid SPAC offerings and don't do that stuff. You want to make money on covered calls? Sell covered calls on Target. Sell covered calls on Apple. Sell covered calls on Costco. Sell covered calls on Spy. You do it with companies that you don't that you know you're not going to get fucking rugged when their earnings come out. Anyways, this episode is super important. I encourage you, if you blanked out at any point during this episode, you should probably re-listen to it. Because what I'm sharing in this episode is 100% the highest probability of anything I ever share for people to reach financial freedom. But it's only going to be used by people that can have this sort of patience to value compounding consistently over exacerbated returns during a short window of time. So anyways, if this was interesting, uh, make sure that you share Tiny Town with somebody who you feel needs to hear it. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode.